This lecture is being brought to you in part by the generous gifts of these sponsors. Um, so, my name is Jeff Phillips, as, as she mentioned, and I've been working at IHMC for about five years. And so, tonight I'm going to give you a chance to kind of get to know what I do, and then we're going to talk about science in a more philosophical way, in general. All right, so as she said, I am Jeff Phillips. I am from Alabama, and so that star depicts where I'm from, a small town called Sandflat. Um, it's actually not a town at all. It's a hamlet. Uh, the nearest town is Thomasville, and it's a town of 4,000, um, and, and that is where I was sort of, I wasn't born there. I was obviously born in Mobile. We don't have hospitals in Thomasville, or at least we didn't. And I was raised there and then went to the University of Alabama, which after all is the Harvard of Tuscaloosa County. Roll Tide. <laughs> My area of specialization is in cognitive psychology, experimental psychology. These days the kids are calling it cognitive neuroscience. I guess it makes it sound a little bit sexier. Uh, but I like to use uh, the tools and science that I've learned to solve real world problems. Uh, so I apply myself mostly to what's called human factors or engineering psychology. I don't work in mental health, except for how it relates to human performance on the battlefield or at work. But read the disclaimer, so it's on you not to take the advice, because I'm gonna dole it out. Just can't help myself. All right, so as, as, as she mentioned in my uh, introduction, I've only worked really for two groups uh, in my, my career. Uh, first, I started at the Naval Medical, um, I'm sorry, Naval Aerospace Medical Research Laboratory in Pensacola, Florida. And this was a great place to start my career. It, uh, if you don't know about Pensacola, I'm sure a lot of you do, it is literally the birthplace of naval aviation. So that is where naval aviation started. And so I've always been fascinated with the military, and, and I come from a, a family that has always served and supported the military, and so I could literally walk right outside, see the old hangars where those first flying boats were lowered into the water. And I got to work on problems that were affecting individuals in the Navy and Marine Corps. Um, very proud legacy around this lab. The first monkey to be sent to space to, to land and live a, a full life. She was our monkey. Uh, I think that was 1950, gosh, I'd eight maybe, something like that. Uh, and, uh, and then all of the, the original astronauts had trained on the devices at our lab uh, and you know, got to sort of stand in the shadow of giants. And, and on their shoulders in some cases, so I'm very fortunate. Uh, in 2011, we were moved. So they shut the lab down in Pensacola, and they moved us to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base to be co-located with the Air Force. Uh, now that was great because we did gain some synergy with the Air Force, but we lost our connection to the Navy and to naval aviation. Um, so in 2017, they actually sent me back to Florida uh, to work at IHMC, and then I was still half time with them for four years, um, doing what they call an IPA, so I was sort of a civilian employee of the government who was actually a contractor. It's a weird situation, but you can only do that for four years, and so now I am full time with IHMC, and very happy to be here. Uh, as long as I can remember, though, it has always been my dream to retire. And, and I'm not joking, I had an Uncle Fred who retired early, and when I was in the first grade, that is when I decided that that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be retired like my Uncle Fred. <laughs> All right, so some highlights. Lori covered a lot of these. Um, the first thing I published, the first study that, that kind of got me attention, was actually on handshaking. And this was just a little study we did whenever I was an undergraduate at Alabama. And we matched personality characteristics with handshaking characteristics. And we were seeing if there was a correlation, and there wasn't, right? But what we did learn is that although your handshake does not really tell anybody about your personality, you're being judged on your handshake very harshly as if it does, 
right? Uh, so this got published in a big journal, went over the AP wire, we were on The View, hard copy, it was crazy. And so I, I remember my, my professors saying, well, Jeff, your career has nowhere to go but down. <laughs> <clears throat> but then uh, after graduate school, started working in Pensacola with the Navy, first project I got was to develop a psychomotor tool to help us select naval aviators. We were losing a lot of money because we would select these guys. They were intelligent enough. They had all the skills to be a good pilot, but they didn't have the hand-eye coordination and the, and the spatial skills. So we developed a tool that would kind of select those people out of the pipeline. And at least to date, they say that it has saved the Navy over half a billion dollars. Now, how do you save the Navy? Money, right? That's kind of an absurdity in itself. They're just gonna build another ship, but hey, I'll, I'll take it, whatever. Uh, then after that, I, I conducted a study that won an award because it got a drug called modafinil on the Navy's formulary. Now, modafinil is a go pill, is what it's called in the military. You take it as a stimulant for sustained operations to keep you sort of on edge so that you can do your job for long periods of time without sleeping. We've been using dexedrine, which is it's a very strong amphetamine. This is more subtle, and so it, it helps. Never a magic bullet for fatigue, but sleep, obviously. And I was the first to document what's called the hypoxia hangover effect. Now, if you're not familiar with hypoxia, we're just talking about oxygen deprivation. So when pilots are aloft, right, they're at a higher altitude. As you go up in altitude, there's less barometric pressure. And so at your lung, in the alveoli, there's less pressure to get the oxygen across into the bloodstream. So what we do to offset that is we give them higher concentrations of oxygen. Well, if that life support system goes down, or if there's a leak, then they get hypoxic, right? And, and we're gonna talk about that here in just a minute because I have done more hypoxia work than anything. So, I mean, call me, no one has died, but I almost feel like Dr. Death, right? I mean, I'm taking people, it's a very intimate thing, I'm putting a mask on them, I'm depriving them of oxygen until they almost pass out. I'm seeing what they can do, what they can't do, and then I'm tracking kind of how they come back online. But I'd, I'd gotten all of this sort of experience in hypoxia, and then there was this event with the F-22, wherein we lost a guy. He went from flying straight and level to a smoking hole in the side of a mountain in about 30 seconds, and we investigated this thoroughly. This spooked a lot of pilots. And so they went on 60 Minutes and they said they didn't feel safe flying this plane anymore. And so they grounded it. And, uh, and that's a big problem because this is our most capable warbird. I mean, it really is. Stealth, it's, and we only have less than 200 of them. So we did a thorough investigation. I was a part of the team that got this back into flight. After that, we basically realized that we were having this problem DOD-wide in all of our tactical aviation assets. We were grounding training uh, assets. We were backing up the pilot pipeline. And so we had to double down and we kind of solved that crisis as well. You know, for all of these things, I've won a bunch of awards. Um, there are still problems associated with that that I don't believe are solved. And so those awards, you know, they're great, but if you've ever been in the military and you've served, you know, there's a problem, you have an objective, you're never focused on the award. You're like, that's great, but we still have work to do. But, you know, I guess it's good to be recognized. Um, I am an applied scientist, not really a theoretical guy. Now, that doesn't mean I'm not interested in theoretical science, but what it means is that I want to develop solutions and products through science that'll make the world a better place and help people. And there's no one that I want to help more than those men and women who serve in our U.S. Armed Forces. Um, and so, just like I, I mentioned in the, uh, the aviation situation with the, the pilots getting the symptomology like hypoxia, we're trying to find strategies. They did not, they were not designed to live at that altitude, to go 1,200 miles an hour, to stop on a dime. You know what happens when pilots turn 
all the blood goes to their legs. And if you're not careful, they pass out. So we have to train them to, to do these maneuvers to push the blood back up. I mean, it's, it's a crazy environment. So warfare is serious business, right? It kind of takes the, the urgency level up. And so in my line of business, we don't always wait to find out why something gives us a performance advantage over the enemy, right? We do it if it does. And so that's really my job. My job is focused on people give me solutions, I develop solutions. Is this really going to help somebody in the military? Or is this just dead weight that's a waste of taxpayer dollars and something else to put in their pack? That's what they rely on me for. I'm kind of the gatekeeper, if you will. Um, now, one of the things that I'm going to tell you, uh, I'm going to take you through just a couple of the projects that, uh, that I'm working now. The, the first one is, is one that's very important to me. I often find myself doing things because they need to be done, not necessarily because I want to do them or and if they need to be done, I typically make a promise that they need to be done. Uh, so one of the things that I've been working on quite a bit lately is trying to raise money for what we call the Robert E. Mitchell Foundation for the Repatriated Prisoners of War. Now this is located on NAS Pensacola, and it is a, um, it's a center where all of the guys that were captured and held in the Hanoi Hilton in Vietnam and all the prisoner of war, prisoners of war uh, from the U.S. operations after that come, they get medical treatment, uh, you know, they're helped with their, their medical services, we collect data on them. Because after the Hanoi Hilton, I'm sure you guys are familiar with that story, some of those guys were held in Vietnam for seven to ten years, you know, in some cases their families thought they were dead, they come home, their wife's married another man. He's living in their house with kids. I mean, I, I can't imagine. But we thought that they would have a shorter lifespan and a higher rate of post-traumatic stress than the normal soldier who served in Vietnam but was not a prisoner of war, right? Turns out they're living seven years longer, and their post-traumatic stress disease is at the same level as everyone else who served, not higher. Why? Why? We want to know why. So we have 50 years of longitudinal data on these guys. We started right after they came home, and we're still collecting it to this day. We just had the 50th anniversary, I think it was in September. So it includes all their medical records, interviews on 9 millimeter, meter, nine millimeter tape, sorry, rubber baby buggy bumpers. And do my tongue's getting tied. All right, so. Um, the problem with this if that, is that this media that's captured on, microfiche, they're old, thing, old, old tapes, um, they're degrading. And if we don't save them soon, they're going to be gone forever. So that's one of the things that I've been trying to help the Navy do, is to find some money to digitize, to store this, preserve it forever, and then codify it so we can use it later. Because at IHMC, you know, we're dedicated to helping the U.S. service member. And we're very interested in resiliency. You know, what makes one individual resilient when another, when another one isn't? And if we want to know about resiliency, I mean, I think we can learn a lot from these individuals. I mean, John McCain, Jeremiah Denton, I mean, the, the list goes on and on. So here's another project that I'm working on, just trying to give you kind of a cross-section of, of some of the work that I'm doing. And these are just two projects. I'm actually probably involved in 12. Um, how many of you have had to wear gloves to do a job? Right? And, and you know, it's, it's always a policy issue. If you get cut, where's your glove? I want to see the cut glove, right? That's what they'll tell you if you work in maintenance or something like that. But the problem's what? You can't do the job with the glove. I mean, how old are gloves? And we have not solved this problem yet. And so cold weather injuries in the military are typically hand injuries, and they're typically associated with having to remove a glove. All right? While I was in Dayton, Ohio, 
One morning, I was driving to work. I think it was eight below. And uh, I had on these thick gloves because the, water, the, the, uh, the heat was out in my truck. And I was trying to change the stations on the radio, and I couldn't do it. And I got the idea for this. It turns out that kind of the touch receptors on your, on your body are laid out in a very predictable pattern. People with larger fingers have less sensitive fingers or uh, fingertips. People with smaller ones have more sensitive fingertips. So if you could take an object, something to transition that haptic uh, feedback back to the fingertip, you could likely solve the problem. And so we've developed two things. One thing that we call the tactile selector. Uh, the tactile selector is this thing right here, and it kind of sits on the tip of the glove. You can also see it right over here. And you can interact with your touch screens. You know, it helps with button pushes and so forth. And as you press, it comes back and it touches the tip of your finger and it transfers that haptic feedback to you so that you know how hard you're pressing. And they're also conductive so that you can operate touch screens. Now, this is the haptic flight glove. At least it's a rendering. And so you can see we have the tactile selector on the fingertip and then we have what we call the smaller versions, tactile nodes, located all over the, uh, oh goodness, well, let's take a second, see what the emergency uh, Amber Alert. Okay, well, that's good. No missiles inbound. All right? All right. I mean, every time that happens, that's in the back of my head, especially these days. All right. And so you, you can kind of see how these things are aligned. So you wouldn't need total coverage to have kind of the full sensitivity of the hand. And as the protection gets thicker, you just make the tactile node a little bit longer. And so this is something we're excited about. We have uh, some money from the Air Force to develop this. Uh, we've had injuries in the Air Force. If they're in Alaska or bases that are higher, if they have to bail out, they, um, they encounter 600 mile an hour winds at least, 40 below temperatures. So you'll lose a finger in a second. And they cannot do the job with the gloves they have. So it's just like everywhere else. Wear your gloves. I can't wear my gloves. I can't operate the plane with the gloves. Uh, so we're going to try and solve that problem. All right. But, let's see, how much time did I waste talking about myself? 20 minutes. All right. We didn't come here to talk about me. Right? I just want to give you a kind of a cross-section of what I do, because I'm an applied scientist, not really a theoretical person. Um, and so we're here to kind of talk about science. Science, in my opinion, is going through what I would call a little bit of an identity crisis. All right? Popular culture now is basically representing science as if it is a collection of information that is irrefutable. Right? If you, if you question what I'm saying, then you're an idiot because this is science. Right? And here's some phrases that we've heard kicked around lately. Trust the science. Don't question the science. We own the science. I am the science. This is a full-scale identity crisis. And, and, and those things are going around. What is science? Right? You all know this. And, and so this is review for everyone. I'm not going to tell you anything that you probably don't already know, but I'm going to reinforce what your gut's been telling you the whole time. What science is, is a mere set of tools with which we use to try to understand the world around us. That's all it is. It's not a set of irrefutable facts. It's a tool. It's not all knowing. In fact, there's far more in this universe that we don't know than there is that we know. Way more. Scientific agreement is rare. Scientific consensus never happens. Never. When we hear about it, we scratch our heads and wonder who says there is a consensus. And I'll give you an example on this one. You guys remember when Pluto stop being a planet, and then all of a sudden it's a planet again, right? And you're like, what? They locked astrophysicists in a room, 
And they said, all right, guys, you have 30 minutes. Is Pluto a planet or not? And they're like, well, it kind of is, but ah, ah, no. Yes or no, is Pluto a planet? And so they decided, well, we'll guess we'll say that Pluto is not a planet, because if we include Pluto, then there's about 200 other planets, and we don't want to come up with names for those. Right? So they forced that false dichotomy. Does that make sense? None of those people wanted to say, Pluto is not a planet. They want to say, well, you know, let's think about what a planet is. No. We want an answer. Science doesn't really work that way. And science must always, always be questioned. It thrives on being questioned. Right? We're going to talk about some examples in history, just a few. We're not going to get bored over it. Um, where, you know, it wasn't questioned and it was quenched. And each of you is capable, fully capable, of understanding basic scientific principles and deciding for yourselves what to believe and what not to believe. And there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. And to have a free democratic society, we have to teach other people to do this so that we all become more informed citizens and consumers of science. All right, so the true nature of science, right? The practice of science is like mapping a dark and endless abyss with nothing but a damp book of matches. First, one must struggle to light the flame of discovery with every successful spark. One quickly observes, measures, records, and ponders, only to glimpse in horror when the next spark reveals something one never expected. People are drawn to science because they possess an undeniable compulsion to understand truth in the world around them, yet those who truly come to understand science know that nothing in the world around them will ever be truly understood. All right? That Self-indulgence. Shameless. I mean, look at the writer. And, and possibly plagiarism on the second one. I, I read it back just now, and I was like, I think I've heard that before. All right? So try to make it as profound as I could. Um, it really does feel like this. The universe is huge. There are so many mysteries to solve. We are literally just starting as a species to start to carve away at, at solving these problems. And, you know, I, I, I see young scientists all the time who say, <clears throat> Dr. Phillips, I want to be a scientist, but is there anything left to be discovered? <laughs> are you kidding me? <laughs> Oh, goodness, yeah, yeah, you're, you're safe, don't worry. Um, the way it usually goes for me, if I'm into theoretical stuff, especially with the theoretical stuff, because I have tried that before, we all do that in our dissertation work and so forth, you set out to answer one question, right? You work a year or two on the experiment, and instead of the answer to the one question, you leave with five more questions and the need to conduct five more experiments. It's very frustrating, but it has to be done, and it's all that we have to answer these questions, if we want to answer them. All right, so, and this is, this is like I said, stuff that you already know, all right? We're gonna talk about what is certain and what is uncertain, all right? Science always starts with an observation. Isaac Newton saw things fall to the ground. Right, before that era, I don't know if you know this, but Aristotle had written all this stuff, and people did not question it. Right? There was no science. They basically said, well, Aristotle said this, so you're wrong. And that went on for hundreds of years until sort of the Enlightenment started to take off. Well, it began with an observation. Right? Why do things always fall to the ground. Why is everything attracted to the earth? He made some hypotheses. He tested his theories. He discovered some laws, right? He, he discovered the laws of motion and the universal laws of gravity. And those are laws. Laws are things for which there is no exception. There are very few laws. If it doesn't begin in law, it's uncertain. That's just a fact. Now, there are some things that have more evidence to support them than others, 
but they are all uncertain. All right, and I mean, we can think about classical physics. Again, you know, the age of Aristotle, it was just written word, no one was allowed to question it. And then there were the dark ages, and basically the Catholic Church took over, very similar. You know, no one questioned what had been kind of put forward by Aristotle. Until Sir Isaac Newton and some others came along, they discovered some laws. And in their experiments, they noticed that, hey, th these things are always true, but the more we looked, we would find exceptions, right? And then that lets us know, oh, there are exceptions. Well, these aren't laws, right? Because laws have no exceptions. Therefore, these have to remain theories or hypotheses. Now, <clears throat> back in Isaac Newton's day and Einstein's day, the burden of proof required to take something from the hypothetical bracket here up to the theory bracket was much higher, right? It's just something about human nature. Things have to move faster. They may have to move faster to satisfy us, right? You used to, you have to get the journal, go to the library, print it out. Now you just look at TikTok, right? Whatever. <laughs> and so it's got to move way faster. And so I fear that sometimes we, we kind of move to the theory level faster than we should. Um, but, you know, that's, that's my opinion. Um, and so, you know, as Newton's observations started to break down hypothetically, other people arrived. Einstein, right? With the, the theory of general relativity. And it basically, it, it, it showed why Newton's uh, hypotheses and theories weren't working, added to them, and then corrected them so that now the observations are explained. Right? But what happened then? You guys, are you guys familiar with dark matter and dark energy? Oh, goodness, right? What? What? So you're telling me, hold on, and I'm not a physicist, right? So if, if I get this wrong, you guys, you know, feel free to say, actually, Jeff, <clears throat> Dark energy is the expansion of the universe, right? So it, it's just like stretching. And dark matter, everywhere we looked and we thought there was nothing, it's not nothing at all, it's actually something. What? It's crazy, right? I mean, it's, it's mind warping, but it's interesting and it's fascinating. And, and Einstein's theories break down there. That's kind of this chasm of, of ignorance that, that you see here, where you know, modern physics just can't accommodate those things. And so they're working on theories now to reconcile that. Do I believe we'll ever know all of the mysteries of the universe? Not by a long shot. Not by a long shot. I mean, personally, they're far too complex. And you don't know what you don't know. And so there are always unknown variables. So this is how it's supposed to go in general, right? You're supposed to make an observation, ask a question, formulate a hypothesis. You do an experiment, analyze the results. If your hypothesis is supported, I do have to point it at this screen. If your hypothesis is supported, then great, you report the results. Right? That's evidence for your theory. If it's not supported, then you start over and you try again. Right? If you follow these procedures, then you've got a clear path to a, a nice, rational and objective conclusion. But to be truly objective and to, to work, everything has to be done perfectly at every step. And nothing can be done to bias the data in any direction, right? And let's, let's just think about human processes here for a second. Let's step away from science. Let's say, I don't know, I'm washing the car. Right? If I do everything right, it's going to be perfect. Or, or let's think about drivers, traffic, right? If everybody just drove perfectly, there would be no traffic, right? humans, perfection breaks down very quickly, right? And so what we're going to be talking about next is how people kind of cut corners 
and cheat a little bit here and there and why they do that and how that can distort science for generations. And it's happened over and over. All right, so what are some threats to objectivity? Money. Yeah, that's up here somewhere. Just need for attention, right? I mean, and these are all just, I mean, we're human, sadly. I mean, well, I mean I'm glad to be human. I mean, don't, don't get me wrong. But sometimes our, you know, our failures and our faults, you know, they, they will. They'll, they'll kind of turn you into a misanthrope. Need to publish in peer-reviewed journals, right? If you're a, a college professor, you have to publish in peer-reviewed journals. You have to. If you don't, you're not going to get tenure. You're going to lose your job. You want to keep your job, it, no matter if you're a college professor or like me, you do research professionally. You want to keep working, right? I mean, I have people who work for me. They have families. So it's like any other business. You know, there's this motivation to protect them at all costs. We already kind of covered this one. And, uh, and there are a lot of reasons that uh, I didn't want to follow the tenure uh, track. And, and that's one of them. Just the need to be right. right. Just the need to believe that you're smarter than everyone else and that you're correct. That's often a problem. I have two colleagues. We have this problem in the Navy called spatial disorientation. It's associated with uh, kind of losing your sense of awareness of, with regard to where you are in space. It's the number one killer of our, of our, our naval pilots, Air Force Two. I have two colleagues. One of them says that spatial D is a purely vestibular or inner ear problem, right? The other one says, no, he's an idiot. It's visual. You're both idiots, and obviously you're both right, right? I mean, it's visual and it's vestibular, but I mean, they're human. And, and we all know people who just argue to argue. Scientists are the same. Scientists are the same. Underlying political motivation, right? I mean, science is political. You know, sometimes there's a public policy that, that's kind of hinged on a scientific study. And so they can have uh, sort of dire outcomes if, if not done correctly. And here's the first one that was called out, right? It, it probably really is number one, if I'm being honest. And, and there are many more, but it all leads to the same thing, right? It's Mark Twain. You got to love the guy. Lies, damn lies, and statistics. Now, we all have been presented with stuff before that just did not seemed true, seemed to be true at all, right? And you felt insulted that it was presented to you as the truth. And our gut told us that can't be right. But it's science, don't question it. If you question it, you're anti-science. Not true, question away. So failure point one, operationalization. This is how science, scientists lie to you. How are the variables defined? All right, here's one, and, and this is just a little personal gripe. It's one that, that, that I've never liked. Self-awareness in animals that aren't human. The way it is measured is they'll take the animal, they'll put a little dollop of paint on their paw or their ear, and they'll put them in front of a mirror. If the animal looks and like, touches the dollop, well, then they're self-aware. If it doesn't, then they're not. All right, so self-aware animals, bonobos, pygmy chimpanzees, chimpanzees, gorillas, dolphins, some whales, no other self I mean, Is that really a good way to define self-awareness? I mean, couldn't that be just understanding reflection, right, or, or some other things? I, I don't know, but we can get mired in a definition like this, right? And it can, it can lead to the public understanding that things are a little different than they actually are, just because of the way they are defined. All right, so hypothetical situation. What if I was saying, hey, poverty and suicide are not linked, right? They're not linked, and I'm going to prove it. So I set out, and I say, okay, 
the poor, anybody who makes $100,000 or less, I'm going to define as the poor. Anybody who makes over $100,000, I'm going to define as non-poor. There's no difference. And I say, see, there's no difference. Well, problem there, right? With the way I define poverty. Obviously, I didn't find what I was looking for because I didn't set it up correctly. And you've got to watch for little things like this because they matter. And this is political as I will get. This is the most recent one. That was an operational definition. If you tested positive with COVID-19, even if you were on hospice and you've been dying of lung cancer for the last six months, that was a COVID-19 death. That was a bad way to operationalize that and it led to some pretty sour consequences. All right, failure point two, experimental design. Most disciplines have minimal standards, right? Um, but they don't have the same standards. Now, I'm a psychologist, and on some level, I'm just going to throw this out here, you guys be kind, everything we say is bullshit <laughs> on some level, right? So the standards to prove that what we say is true is higher than some other disciplines. And, and I deal with this all, you're, a, you're not a scientist. Well, then why do I design your studies for you? Anyway, um, but they're not the same. And so kind of the burden of proof in one discipline isn't always the same as the other one. You tell me what you want the study to find, I'll make it find it. I can replicate it 100 times. Now, luckily, now I've never done that. I do have ethics, but it can be done very easily. Everything that you do in science has to be planned out in advance, a priori, before the fact, right? Otherwise, you just described what you observed and you formulate a hypothesis around that, hypothesis around that right? Remember that graph that we had, or that, that chart that we had where if your hypothesis is not supported, you start over? Well, the problem with that is, I got half a million dollars from the US Navy to study this, and I told them I had the answer, but it didn't work. But what I could do is formulate a new answer. You can't do that. And science is filled with that these days, filled with it. I mean, we just, we just completed a study on dehydration in, in aviators because there was a study and it found a 57% deficit in flight performance at 2% dehydration as measured by body weight. 57%. Now, I've been around these guys for almost 20 years now. Oh, no way, right? I can deprive these guys of oxygen to the point that they don't know their name and they're flying that airplane like nothing is wrong with them. And that's the problem with hypoxia. They pass out before they know what's going on. Um, so I, I didn't buy it. And it turned out that's what the author of that study had done. He set up a comparison where he tested a person, dehydrated them, and then tested them again. He didn't find anything. Well, then all of a sudden, he just split them in half and sorted them out with this bad operational definition. And lo and behold, but those, those differences were there at the beginning and were associated with the differences in the individuals themselves and not with dehydration. And now we just spent half a million dollars of the government's money showing that dehydration alone does not have an effect. <sighs> Serendipity, and this gets to that. If you find something by chance, it should be an observation, right? You still have to start over. You can't just call it a hypothesis but this is done all the time. And that's why we have to replicate. You know what that means? We have to do it over and over and over again. One study doesn't prove anything, nothing at all. 10 studies, you're still at the hypothetical level. 35, 40, you're ready to talk theory. And that's just the truth. All right, statistical analysis. Just like the study itself, the analysis has to be laid out ahead of time. 
the analysis should be straightforward. I mean, if I got to put this thing through a wood chipper and like a particle accelerator to make it show significance, it's probably not there, right? If I have to do some fancy statistical analysis to show that something works, it probably doesn't work. So when possible, you should use the same old conventional test that everyone uses. P-values. Are you guys familiar with these? Does anybody know about p-values? We, we have some science people here. How many of you heard this? There were differences, but they were not statistically significant. All right? What does that mean, right? Well, basically, it's set up to tell you what the probability is that you would find that result by chance. All right? So it's comparing your your, your variance within the group by your variance between groups. And so you're basically saying, do I want to be 95% sure this is true? And if you want to be, you set it at 0 0.05, right? And what that implies is that if you want to measure a difference, this is the, I was pressing the wrong button, standard bell curve, right? You guys are familiar with this the normal distribution, and there's something called the 68-95-99.7 rule. If data is normally distributed, 68% of your observations will be one standard deviation from the mean. 95% of your observations will be two standard deviations from the mean. So if I'm comparing a sample, a special group, to a population, if they are two standard deviations from the mean, their mean is? chances are it's significant at that 0 0.05 level. And it's because of this 68, 99.7 rule. The problem with this is for this to be true, the data has to be normally distributed, All right? We're assuming a normal distribution because that is what is true with the 68, 99.7 rule. Human performance data is never normally distributed. Never. And so we do. We try to normalize the data. It usually means we have to remove outliers, you know, people who create the skewed distribution. And then we usually mean replace those with the mean from the rest of the distribution. Depending on how I do that, I can come up with a very different result. Right? The devil, as they say, is in the details. Effect size versus practical effect size. This is used in medicine a lot, especially to motivate behavior, because you know, they want you to get the screening, whatever it is, and sell you the product and on some occasions. Um, so you'll hear something like, this makes it 100 times less likely for you to catch X, right? Or, or whatever, develop this disease. What if your probability of developing that disease is already 0 0.0000001, and you're moving the, the decimal two places to the left? Is that worth your time and concern in a medical procedure or, or anything? Probably not. And so just because something is statistically significantly different does not mean that it matters. So you have to look at that effect size. And then you have, to, you have to interpret that effect size against the real world, right? So we were testing motion sickness drugs. We found one, it was pretty good. It was gonna provide two minutes of motion sickness abatement. Well, I, I, what, you know, okay, you got two minutes, boys. <laughs> you know, fight as much of the war as you can. Just not practically significant, but very statistically significant. And so, you know, you have to be careful uh, with regard to, to interpreting the effect size. Always ask, what is that original percent chance, and how is that decimal moving? All right, interpretation and inference. For me, this is the most subjective portion of it all. They tell, scientists play fast and loose with this. Again, we're under pressure to publish, to find a result that is interesting. And because scientists will play fast and loose with it, 
The public needs to learn how to interpret it. And the public needs to have the confidence to know that they're right. Right? To hold the scientists accountable. Because scientists are human too, need to be held accountable. Public generally relies on the experts. And you hear that too, rely on the experts. Well, you know, there are a lot of different kinds of experts, you know? If you take your car to the mechanic, he's an expert. In my experience, he's going to find something wrong with it, and it's going to be expensive. <laughs> Here's a big problem. Once an inference is made, it is often telephoned across the scientific landscape, like that 57% reduction in performance. They, the Navy Safety Center put out a bulletin on that. They didn't bother to read the article. They sent it out. It went across the Navy. Scientists do that, too. They don't read the article they're citing. They read the citation that someone else has written, and then they, they base their citation on that, and then someone else does that. And before you know it, the original effect is something completely different. We have this thing in psychology, um, or human factors, really, called the yerkes dodson curve. And it's, it's actually a law, the yerkes dodson law. It's one of the few laws that we have in human factors. And it's about stress and performance. And basically, there's a U-shaped relationship between stress and performance. If there's no stress, people don't perform well. All right? You've got to stress them a little to get the work out of them. And there's this optimal level of stress that you can put them under. And then if you overstress them, their performance will start to break down, right? They're overstressed. So you want to find that optimal level of stress. And, you know, I was looking into this. I was reading all these papers about the yerkes dodson law. And I finally figured out, I got to the original paper. They were shocking rats' feet to see how fast they could get through a maze. And that's how it was discovered. So if you, if you shock their feet just a little, right, they don't get through the maze very fast. They lollygag. If you shock it at just the right amount, blazes right through there. If you zap those rats, they can't move. They won't get through that maze at all, right? But this principle has now been carried along human performance across the board. It's a law. And so we use that quite a bit in the military to improve performance. This is a very important thing. And if you, know, if, if you don't take anything away from this but this, I'm happy. Correlation does not prove causation. There's always room for a mediator. And I'll tell you what that is with an example here in a minute, right? We're talking about the mysteries of the universe. We don't know what we don't know. That's the biggest problem in science. We take variables, we cram them into an analysis, we see what predicts an outcome. If my alpha level is 0 0.05, and I throw 4,000 variables into a model, by chance, I'll get 20 variables. I just read a paper the, the other day that did that. Right? You don't know that those 20 variables are related to your outcome, or if there are other variables that are related to the outcome that are mediating that effect. What do I mean by mediation? Because I always get mediation and moderation mixed up, too. Ice cream cells have a 57% positive correlation with drownings in an area. Don't eat ice cream, guys. Don't let your kids eat ice cream. And by all means, don't let your grandchildren eat ice cream. Right? I mean, we, we know there's no causal link between ice cream and drownings. We use this in statistics to drive this point home. So there's a mediating variable, right? Can anyone tell me what it is? Exactly, it's temperature, <laughs> right? These two variables aren't related at all. They're mediated by temperature. Temperature goes up, people swim more, people eat more ice cream. Eating ice cream does not put you in danger of drowning other than the fact that it is summer. You cannot be an advocate for a cause and be a scientist. You can. There are a lot of advocacy groups these days, and they're, they're posing as scientists. They're not. 
That is propaganda. This is a formula that proves it. All right, now that's, that's from a friend of mine, Ryan Mays. I have to quote him here. He, when, when he came up with this, he, he said he was excited because he knew he had done the best thing he, would, he had ever done, but he was sad because he knew that he had done the best thing he would ever do. <laughs> and so here, I mean, we're trying to fix an airplane. That's all we're doing. We're trying to fix an airplane so that our guys and girls can go perform the missions that they want. And politics is getting in the way. It's getting in the way because there are big defense manufacturers that you know, have to be held accountable. And, and, and that's true across science. And, and I've lost my objectivity, right? I'm a, I'm a pilot's guy. I always side with the pilot over the life support system. Every time over the weapon system. And so I have to be careful, right? And make sure that I don't put myself in a situation where my object, uh, non-objectivity is gonna get me into trouble or others. Now this is a big problem. The media have become the gatekeepers of truth. Scientific media are no different. They're composed of scientists who all have their own motivating factors, their own greed, they're all human. They're all human. A lot of studies don't even get on the official record. So we call that the file drawer effect. If it's not interesting, it doesn't get published, right? Now, let's think hypothetical situation. Let's say someone is arguing a point and they're after grant money and they want to publish. And another guy says they're wrong, right? But most of the group agrees with this original guy. Do you think that other guy's papers are going to get published? Probably not. And so they will. They'll bully each other around, keep ideas at bay because they're a threat to them and their ideas. So who should be the arbiter of truth? I don't have an answer to this question. You know, I, I, I kick this around a lot. Um, it may be in question because they just put out a, a, an order that basically says all study results funded by you guys, us, have to be available to us. And so this is going to kind of bust open that peer review, uh, private journal situation a bit. And it, and it may lead to some opportunities for, you know, better, more hybrid ways to share science. I mean, I've got about 10 ideas. If anybody's interested in getting with me, let's do a startup. I mean, you know, you could publish the paper and then people could comment on it. You could have your blue check marks, who are the scientists in that area. They could comment on it in real time. It could be more of a living document. I don't know. I think it's a good idea. But science is non-certain. Everything except for the laws themselves will change, right? Every model will change. Scientific fact only belongs to the laws. Hypothetical and theoretical models are simply our best guess based on the information we have. They are not hard truth. We gotta put objectivity above everything else if we're, if we're scientists. It's, it's very difficult to do, but we have to. Science is human, and it shares every human flaw. So, what's truth? What's the, what's the difference between knowledge and belief, right? I mean, this is, this is something I've read quite a bit about, I mean, it's, I don't know, right? <laughs> I admit it. It's philosophical, I, you know. It floats around somewhere between belief and truth, right? But who can be sure what truth is? And so the whole idea here is that, you know, the more we learn, the more we realize how much we don't know, how much there is to learn. And so in a lot of cases, you know, the statement that almost anything is possible is true. And so, um, <clears throat> you know, I want to encourage all of you not just to take science at face value, you know. Take an opportunity to, to learn about basic research methods. You can do it. Every one of you is smart enough to do it. You know, don't let it be sort of this castle on a hill that you don't think that you can, you can get into. It's not. They're just human beings, have the same flaws. Most of them aren't even really that smart. <laughs> Except for this one, not kidding. Um, 
And, and so that's my message to you, is, you know, don't take someone else's truth as the absolute truth. You know, if you're interested in a subject matter, don't be afraid to read about it. Don't be afraid to look at how they made those comparisons, define those variables. If it doesn't resonate with you, you have the right to not believe it, right? Help us hold us in check, right? Because otherwise, I think we all become mad scientists. We all know where that leads, right? We've all seen enough superhero movies. And so uh, at this point, if anyone is interested, I would be happy to entertain any questions. Yep. It's right at six now, but I, I don't mind. I can, I can answer yeah, a lot of them. So I'm Lisa with HDG Hotels. We hope you enjoy your stay oh, um, thank you. with us. If you don't, I need you to remember the ice cream and drowning correlation and that. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. It's not, not you. It's not you. Um, but my no. question is, and I, and I mean this seriously, just to see your reaction to it. Um, did you see the movie Top Gun Maverick? I have not. Oh. I know. So I've resisted. My, so my follow-up question would have been your thoughts because, you know, it makes us think if we watched it that everything you're discussing is what the movie was absolutely about. So um, So they are a lot like that. I mean, they are very interesting individuals. They're very smart. They're very outgoing mostly. I mean, they're individuals too. Um, and I, I would have to say that being around them and, and the U.S. Marine Corps, um, I mean, all who serve, um, but pilots, I mean, some of my favorite people uh, that, that I've been around, very outgoing, very down to earth, believe it or not. Um, but yeah, they're kind of the way they play around and treat each other, that's exactly how it is. It's all about flying up and hopping out, like that's what it was. That's yeah, so, um, and if you think about it, airplanes don't turn like this, fighter, fighter jets, right? They turn like this. So when you do this, let's say you're going 1,200 miles an hour, and all of a sudden you do this. You're basically slamming on the brakes, and your feet are pointed out, so all the blood is forced to your lower extremities. You have on what we call uh, the um, anti-G suit, so it squeezes your legs to try to force some of that blood back up because you lose eye-level blood pressure and you'll pass out. They pass out, and they'll come back and grab the, the stick and throttle, but you know if they're out for too long, it's too late, and there's nothing we can do to... To save them but yeah it's and, and the one he did I did see that maneuver where he went over the mountain so when he went over the mountain if you notice instead of going like this he did this that is to switch the g-forces so he doesn't pass out all right and you can think about the physics of it. it's crazy and and basically your vestibular system is so overridden by the the force of the jet and the speed that that's all you can perceive Dr. Ed, uh, Jonathan Edwards, excellent, excellent Thank you. lecture. I've published much myself. And what's your, uh, the, where do you get your, the whole notion of p-values is number, number one question. And my second question is kind of philosophical, but is Popper dead? Is Popper dead? Split. Carl Popper. Oh. <laughs> um, will you expand on your question about p-values? Do black swans exist? You, everything you're going with the p-value is that statistics don't matter. William Briggs, Stove have all written on this extensively, which I'm pr pretty sure you've read some. I, and uh, I actually met Dr. Briggs uh, some weeks ago. So the whole lecture was around, is Popper dead? Do black, you know, we're all, if a black swan exists, is your hypothesis absolutely out of the water? No, there's a cause for everything. And we don't know what we don't know. Therefore, should we even be using p-values ever? Oh, yeah, and that, that's a good question. And, and I was not familiar with that. that so I'm not familiar with that, that particular book. And so I apologize. I didn't follow the question early. And I, I wasn't necessarily, it's all we have. You know, it's, it's, the question is, should we use p-values? We shouldn't use the conventions. All right, back in the day, it, believe it or not, when I started doing statistics, you didn't get the actual p-value. You would, you would do your ANOVA by hand, you would get a critical F value, and you would look it up in the book, and in the, your, your only choices were greater than 0 0.05, less than point, right? You're, you're, you never had the actual p-value, but now you do. And so what I would say, at a minimum, just post the p-value. 
the actual p-value, and let the reader make the determination. All right? Now, something recently came out. I'm not going to get political, but it was basically asking, if you do x, is there a negative outcome? Right? And it was set up in a way that I believe was designed not to find the negative outcome. All right? So basically, they were looking at a, two groups of people. One had consumed X, the other hadn't, and there was a certain negative outcome that they thought was associated with this particular product. And um, when you look at the study, the p-value to reject the null hypothesis, which would mean that, yes, this is poison, was 0 0.08. They had set their alpha level at 0.05. Right? That means I want to be 95% sure that I'm correct in rejecting the null hypothesis. 95.1% sure, actually. Or it's not significant, and it's, it's a nothing burger. Don't look here. In this case, they're 92% sure it's poison. Right? Now, if, if you're faced with that question, are you going to eat it? No. I, I'd prefer something in the 20s, maybe? I, I mean, I don't know. And, and so that's, that's what I, I was kind of... It's, they're arbitrary, right? They're set up, uh, and we've just fallen to this point zero 0.05. And we use it over and over. It's the, conven the convention. There's no reason. And, and it's really because a lot of other scientific disciplines, they get so much into their hypothetical work and thinking about the variables themselves that they don't learn about experimental design and statistics. And, and I feel lucky to be a psychologist because, like I said, the burden of proof is so high that, that we get that training. So, yeah, I'm going to let one more question. Just one more question. I would stay up here all night. Okay. You know what? Can, can I, I don't know. We probably have places to be. Mine's not actually a question. Um, if you like to geek out on science stuff, I don't know how you feel about him, but um, you can YouTube Neil deGrasse Tyson. He has really interesting interviews with scientists. And if you listen to podcasts, I can recommend Infinite Monkey Cage. Wow, I've never heard of that one. They have, um, it's Brian Cox, he's a physicist in England, and it's a comedian, and they usually have a panel of three scientists, or three astronauts, and it's all different topics. And um, it's Infinite Monkey Cage, that's what it's called. And let's not forget IHMC well, STEM talk. I was going to say, the, the, uh, the <laughs> podcast that I, we recommend, <laughs> I don't know that many of y'all know, but IHMC has the number one science and technolo technological podcast in the country. Really? It's named STEM Talk. It has about four million listeners a day. Oh, and uh, you can go on and find any, uh, all the subjects and I bet Jeff's even... Yeah, they even let me do talk. one of those. Yeah. So you can hear all about the airplanes. <laughs> I said the word absolutely in that interview, I think, 127 times. Yeah. <laughs> so I know you had... I'm going to take one more question, um, this gentleman in the back, and then I, uh, we're going to have to wrap it up. And uh, I'll look forward to seeing everyone on November 17th. And uh, y'all have a great rest of your night and enjoy sip and shop downtown tonight yeah so yeah you guys just walk right on out and apparently have things for you to sit you know we don't sip we too much because you will shop we have the climate change uh, problem and you know we got warehouser who has all the wood chips in the world so Gainesville got the wood chip factory and uh, we have uh, all the ethanol being put in the gas, and uh, the, the question is, is it helping one bit <laughs> with, with the world? So the question is, is around climate change. Well, it's, it's about using the fact of money changing science. Is, is my, my oh, absolutely. Um, I, I have to be careful here, because people are very sensitive around this issue. Right, and the last thing I want is to make anyone feel less than or stupid for, for feeling the way that they do. As a scientist, if I'm going to be frank with you, all right, we're talking about a system that is likely over 3 billion years old. Right? We're talking about the ecology of the Earth. We have 150 years of data. It turns out when we started collecting that temperature data, we were in the midst of a mini ice age. The warming trend that, that we're so 
worried about is two degrees over the last hundred and something years. They're blaming it on carbon dioxide, right? I mean, typically, that's, I don't personally buy it. I could be wrong. I could be completely wrong. I give, I expose people to carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide makes you better at things, actually, to a point, right? Carbon dioxide is very good for plants. I mean, the world has never been greener, and there is a cycle in which carbon dioxide is, you know, the plants turn it into oxygen. In fact, I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but the reason that we have oxygen in the atmosphere, it was the product of air pollution from sea algae. Before that, there was no oxygen in the atmosphere. It was just nitrogen. And so, you know, that air pollutant actually gave rise to all aerobic life on Earth. So who's to say, you know, the Earth changes. The Sierra Desert went from lush forests to desert in 30 years. That was a long time before the Industrial Revolution. This system is so complex, I can almost guarantee you what we think we know about it is wrong. And that's just, that's opinion, because it's such a complex problem. And the most powerful greenhouse gas on Earth is what? Methane. It's actually water. <laughs> Methane second. Water. Anyway, uh, there was another guy over there that had his, uh, his hand up. Well, uh, I'm sorry, Jeff. We're oh, I apologize. I'm, 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 sorry, I'm taking no. control of the yes, lecture. No, and, I'm, and I'm taking it back, okay? <laughs> I count on strong women to keep me in my place. <laughs> I know. Um, all right, you guys, thank you so much. We'll see you on November 17th. Thank you guys very much. It's been my pleasure. I really enjoyed it.